Welcome to the fourth episode of the Indoensers podcast. Today, I am joined by one of the top young music directors in the Tamil film scene, who is the composer for films like Yadumagi Nindrai and Vidhi Madhi Ulta. After receiving a Bachelor of Science in Recording Arts at Full Sail University, he then returned to Chennai and set up his own studio called Shimmer Studios. On top of his involvement in mainstream cinema, he is also extremely active as a music director for short films and as an independent composer too. To talk about his journey till date, I am pleased to be joined by Ashwin Vinayagamurthy. Hey, how are you? How are you? Yeah, doing great. So awesome. let's sort of follow tradition on this podcast and we usually go right to the beginning, right to your earliest okay. days and try to track yeah. your journey to where you are today. Mm-hmm. So while you weren't born into a musical family, I understand that your father was a massive audio enthusiast and you've said yeah. in other interviews that he was a big influence on you. So in your earliest days, what sort of music was surrounding you and was going around in your household? Probably classic rock the most. So anything Eagles, Police, Phil Collins. Uh, so classic rock, soft soft rock, alt pop, all these kinds of genres were uh, uh, possibly what I was listening to while I was growing up. Also, I think uh, early... Uh, uh, Rahman hits, Devasa hits, uh, Ila Raja sir, all of these uh, people's songs came in. Um, so radio was big back then and we, we all used to travel. So um, they used to hear a wide variety of music. But in the household, I think uh, a lot of Western music, a lot of uh, early Raja sir, Rahman sir, it's predominantly. So as, as I mentioned earlier on, your father was really big on listening to music on good speaker systems. And you brought up radio. So I'm wondering, do you think your exposure to listening to music with, you know, really good output compared to, you know, the compressed radio sound helped you naturally understand things about sound and music that you may have not done otherwise? Pretty much. That was actually a very accurate way of putting it, uh, uh, putting it together. The main thing is you only understand high fidelity audio or uh, high resolution audio or uh, you know all the importance of all the small little little details in songs when you have the equipment to actually listen to it. most composers have like a really decked out studio so they can listen to all these small sounds but how does that sound go and translate into radio or any small speaker that's also what a composer tries to do the engineering team tries to do because there's so much detail that they don't want the people listening on the radio also to miss out. So, uh, but there's, there's only so much you could do. So having the equipment really opened my mind to a lot of uh, details that would have otherwise gone missing. So you brought up how, when you, when you were younger, you were listening to Western rock and some of Rahman and Ilaraja's early hits. But when you're a child, I'm also aware that you started learning Carnatic music after your school teacher thought that you had potential in singing. And alongside that, you were starting to learn the piano as well. And, you know, sometimes often as kids at that age, we do these things sort of passively. And we do them because we think it's the right thing to do or because everyone else around us is doing it. And it can take a few years for active interest or perhaps active disinterest to kick in. So in your case, when do you think that active interest or active inclination towards music came about? I think I was jack of all trades. I used to swim. I was a national swimmer. I used to play cricket. I was a district level cricket player. Uh, I used to be the academic topper in school. So there were just too many things on my plate where I didn't really think, uh, oh, I had to I had to go this way because I was ex- excelling in this. There were, you know, flashes of uh, promise in a lot of things. So choosing music came out of a necessity, basically. Uh, uh, 10th standard, 11th standard, 12th standard, you know, uh, what am I going to choose? What, what, what is going to be my future was the question that was running in, in my head and all of my classmates' head. 
And one thing that I despised was IIT. The word IIT, I just used to hate. I don't know why. It, it just it just seemed cool to be the kid who hated IIT. So I was like, no, I'm just going to do something cooler than all you guys. So, so music was, uh, was just helpful there because, okay, I knew this uh, particular thing, but I had to learn a lot more to kind of uh, gradually progress into that. Um, so it came about in a necessity kind of way more than more than you know me having promise or brilliance because i didn't really have promise or brilliance at that point it was just i was also one of those kids who used to go to the piano classes yes i used to ace them but you don't really find prodigies in every 10 kids there's a one in a million so i really am not a prodigy more like work taught me a lot more along the way yeah, so, so you brought up how around the 10th, 11th standard was when that sort of switch flicked. And I think a big moment for you, if I may say so myself, in your journey towards becoming a professional musician was your meeting with music director G.V. Prakash. And he had invited you to a studio and one thing led to another and soon he was recording you singing. But things didn't quite have a fairy tale ending there, I think it's fair to say. And you know, he plainly said that you shouldn't pursue singing. So given your initial passion towards singing, was there any part of you that wanted to push on and prove him wrong? Or did you just sort of accept it and take the move towards production? Uh, the major thing is, uh, even though I liked singing, I had a passion for singing. When, when you're actually listening to a studio recorded version of your voice, you are hit with reality. So I, I could have chosen two things. One, to be in denial and uh, keep pursuing a dream that was not going to happen if, with the amount of training that I was putting in. Because GB said, don't sing because it's going to take another five years, six years for you to even get to a point where you'll be okay with uh, whatever you want to sing. So he said, you know, get into music making, keep singing along the way, but you don't sing. Don't put that as your primary focus was, was what he told me, which is exactly what I grew into like 10 years down the line from when we had that conversation to now I'm singing most of my compositions and I have to sing uh, the rough tunes that I give out to other singers and stuff so the practice along the way with the music theory that I learned just helped in my singing plus a lot of technology coming in that also helps us singers so I'll, helps us uh, you know composer singers or part-time singers so uh, I didn't really you know, I'm a very re realistic person. So if somebody tells me something is not good, I don't immediately have the will to fight back saying, no, 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 it is good. Until and unless I feel very strongly about it. Mm -hmm. So if somebody co comments on my song track, for you per se, like we've had conversations where I've sent you tracks and uh, you've given me comments. So if I feel very uh, strongly about something, I, I just go with, but I will take their points. I will work on them. I'll see how, how it goes. If I still feel my version is better, I'll, I'll stick with my version. So the way I wanted to do was I kept singing, but I just didn't put that in my, uh, in my sights or in the forefront. I just kept it here, just worked my way with music. And this came along. So it just worked that way. Given that, um, you know, given what happened with yourself in, GB studio, I, I sort of want to ask you a hypothetical question because now you're in the position that GB was in, you know, you've done a few films, you're establishing yourself in the industry and, you know, potential musicians are coming to you to see whether they can turn their ideas into music. Say a musician walks in and, you know, they're really polite and really respectful, but when they play or sing, you don't see any potential in what they're doing. In that case, do you just tell them upfront what you think and say, sorry, I can't help you? Or do you just work with what you've got? The first, first uh, option, because uh, me being a realist, I also have to, you know, be realistic about the hopes that I give out. Uh, if it's a very new person that I don't know that I'm trying to build a relationship with and they are trying to build a relationship with me, uh, if I see a spark, if, if there's some kind of, uh, uh, you know, spark there, I will tell them to, you know, pursue, continue, just keep growing in that area. But you're not ready at the moment. But if, uh, if some, 
people just don't exhibit as you say which i've met very far and few very very few people who actually think way too much of whatever they can do and they they consistently underperform i haven't met too many people like that but when that happens i'm as polite as possible but i get the point conveyed that maybe you can do it with another person maybe you can cut it there but your work just doesn't cut cut uh, cut it for what i am doing at the moment so i i draw the line there so if if it doesn't work for me it doesn't work for me it might work for somebody else so you never know and as much as jv prakash maybe did it enjoy your singing he did support you as you started to push towards music production and in addition to that you were taking sound engineering classes at the sae institution and this all culminated in your first album which you completed when you were 17 if i'm correct at this stage what got you to produce an album and what did you want to get out of it basically validation whether i was ready or whether i could do music so it it came through a lot of struggle because at uh, i started that when i was around 15 16 i started the album uh, i don't know what an album was i don't know what an ep was i don't know how to go about it it just sort of happened all these tunes happened over like 6 to 8 months that i compiled them and i thought okay when put together they form this very cohesive kind of uh, story that you could tell with the uh, musical pieces mainly out of validation i just wanted to prove to myself or uh, to my immediate uh, circle that yes i had the chops even when i finished the album i didn't know because uh, whether i was ready or not i was sai dropout i'm i'm pretty vocal about it <laughs> i didn't understand engineering at all i didn't understand what was going on i didn't understand sound at that point i had a year for things but you know sound is a lot more tra- technical than just saying you know i have a year for things i could you know complete an album to my satisfaction i could take a theme i could satisfy myself but i still had this uh, hurdle of not being able to satisfy producers or directors at that point so i was way behind the curve even at that point it took a long while for me to understand why i was way behind the curve because i had to learn a lot more to get to where these guys were working consistently on so the album was just me and to also get into college like they they wanted a portfolio they wanted to see if i was actually uh i had to submit that for a scholarship also so i got in with a grant and scholarship into full sail so the album helped in a lot of ways uh it, it was also a adrenaline rush to like create that get it out to people get feedback from people uh plus the the process of committing to something making an album took a lot of work which i was not uh, aware of so people used to go out in their summer vacations satyam theater they used to have all these uh, hangout spots but me i had to be cooped up in uh, within my confines of four walls because i had to finish that and i didn't really know what to do where to do how to do uh So it took a lot of work. I had to miss a lot of outings. I the huge problems, huge fights with friends, family, and everybody because it's just not the time where you you put all of that energy into a career. So uh, it, it's bittersweet, but mostly sweet. The the process of making it. You've sort of painted a negative picture towards your musical abilities as a child. Was <laughs> <laughs> so when like. putting your ideas into something tangible was there ever that mental block where you no, know you feel this always, is not always still now <laughs> till now that's that that's i think I, I, i've slowly come to uh, the understanding that everybody goes through that everybody has this existential crisis i call it that existential crisis on an everyday basis so you honestly if if somebody gives me a, a a situation and they say okay let's compose for this i'm blank i'm blank as a blank as paper that you can find anywhere and that happens even though i finish an entire film i finish an entire score you bring another one to me i will still be blank so i need to like watch a couple of films hear a couple of albums get inspired you know get ideas okay let's match this let's pick this from here let's start from here let's see how it goes so i think uh, i still feel i'm not ready and uh, some some people who who are like 20 30 40 films in and i when i converse with them they have the same feeling they're like 
dude every time i open a session i think anirudh also in an interview is like every time i commit a project and i open a session i'm really nervous because once the project is done your musical ability is also just vanish with it to conjure up another thing is a whole different ball game it doesn't uh, require talent or anything it just requires you to be present at that point to kind of just transfer all the energy into the right areas mm. so yeah speaking of the album you said you know that was a huge step which helped you get into full sale so i i want to get into full sale but before we get into your time there specifically i know at this point that your goal was to try and learn more about music as a whole but what got you to travel halfway across the world and go to full sale instead of perhaps going to a local college like cam or somewhere else major reason was exposure my uh, parents were uh, vocal advocates of me moving out of the house being on my own figuring out my stuff for like a couple of years or four years whatever the time frame is and then come back i think they have done that for me and my sister so both of us have gone through the same uh, uh, philosophy of uh, having to live out our college years alone uh, we have to kind of uh, uh, support ourselves in that period so that we get ready for the next phase of life kind of uh, uh, philosophy that really helped and that worked for uh, for everybody okay i could have gone to mumbai i could have gone to delhi for why full sale is uh, because it, it was one of the best colleges for uh, sound or music production it still is at that point it was a huge deal and uh, i just didn't know what uh, courses were even there in the engineering colleges here i didn't know what computer science courses were i didn't know what arts courses were i still don't know what 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 a semester is what a, uh, you know what an arrear is i don't know all of that i just don't know indian colleges at all so they were very supportive of just packing me shipping me off to like florida as soon as i finished my exams so i think i finished my exams in march april uh, and may was the results june july august i started college there in full sail so i literally had two months in the middle to kind of say goodbye to all my friends and i was shipped out there but full sail just the sheer advancement in technology uh for the exposure and mainly the philosophy that goes on in our household that you have to support yourself uh, for the for the time being so that you grow up to be a better man or woman after the time frame so you sort of talk about that philosophy of you know, supporting yourself how much of a culture shock was it when you got there major uh you don't blend in anywhere if you think you know you just go walk into a place and you will just fit right in you don't it's not india you you are you are in a very different space but again full sail has this uh, very mixed ethnicity and race uh, uh, culture going on people from all over the world come there so i get to meet australians i get to meet uh, uh, you know people from all everywhere i've i've met a people from ukraine uh it's it's massive so in a class of 40 we'd probably have 20 americans and 20 <laughs> mixed people so it didn't really matter that way but fitting in within that 40 also was took took a lot of time uh second i had to learn how to talk to people how to speak because it was not the language that we are used to conversing in or you know because english is considered a show off if you speak in english with uh, uh with your peers here it's like peter na peter udra so it's 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 it's, it's a very <laughs> Ill- elitist thing to just talk in english so going there you need to kind of have an accent talk to people in a way that they would understand un- understand so and i had to lose the accent after coming back uh, so i had to learn the accent because i didn't want to be the person who used to talk in uh indian english like this i don't know why we became a stereotype so i had to learn the accent and then kind of blend in with people uh i did not have any indian friends uh except for one or two people which i was very mindful about i i said i would rather have more friends abroad than from our own place because that was not going to help me grow in any manner of sort so there were a couple of things that i had to adjust i think the first 3 months i 
cried myself to sleep every day because at 17 i was not even 18 at that point at 17 i started college i turned 18 only the next month i uh, the, i think the second month of college uh, i didn't have any friends there at that point uh, i would just sleep off I, all the lights will go off at 8 o'clock because you don't have anything to do i didn't have like tv or anything for the first 6 months so it was like as as bare bones as a college uh, life uh, thing as a dorm life thing would happen so it was it was a cultural shock but uh, i learned to adapt and from then on you know to, from 6 months on it was like a different uh, ball game altogether so what what got you to go for a science degree with recording arts which i assume would be focused more on the science and engineering side of sound rather than say you know a music production class or a music theory composition class which would have been more art focused I think recording arts had everything in itself now I think they've branched out recording as just recording and music production is just music production at that point back in the day it, it was all inclusive so I had songwriting I had music production bits and pieces of it so if I had to really choose only songwriting then I had to go to a college like Berkeley mm. whereas I was still I was still a late bloomer in music or sound so I had to kind of know everything uh in a very short amount of time that that was pretty much what would have helped me at that point so i chose a science degree but uh, we had all of the courses juxtaposed one another in in the same thing so i didn't really miss out on much if i had to specialize in probably score writing or something i i could have uh, taken a two year masters in like uh, orchestral writing at berkeley or another college but full sail has uh, specialties in the courses that i took they're very mm-hmm. famous for the recording arts course so speaking of your time at full sail um you shared an anecdote on another interview you did with sound engineer kj singh where he said that even after one year at full sail you would be panning the snare to the left and you couldn't understand why it could be in the center that sort of brings me to a more general question but in your opinion to what extent is sound and perception of sound subjective and to what extent is it objective it's 100% subjective there's no objectivity at all no matter what whatever you create sounds good to yourself it sounds very different to another person and if the person is invested in you as an artist they uh, you know look past all the flaws that's why it's so important to get a fan base going for you because people look past the flaws and they listen to a song because they like the artist whether they like the song or not they like the artist so they already invest their time into something so i think art is very 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 subjective but you objectively have to get that subjectivity to the person to to the audience and to make him like whatever you're making that's that's part of the objectivity that should be the goal music making isn't the goal everybody's making music process of getting it to somebody and seeing if what you created resonates with them is the objectivity that people tend to not build and which i understood very 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 late so i suppose it, it would be more of an understanding of a majority subjectivity or a collective subjectivity pretty which much is important pretty much so mm-hmm. what what works for uh, the majority works for you should work for you if it isn't then i think uh, you either play for yourself or you play for the audience i want to find the middle ground i think all artists like to find that middle ground but it's super tough finding that middle ground you can either go this way or you can go that way that's the easier route but trying to find the middle ground is where the objectivity comes in so toward the end of your time at full sail your final project was to design a studio if i'm correct which ultimately led you to set up the studio you're recording this from shimmer studios mm-hmm. but what actually made you want to push through and take this project beyond a project and into something that would pretty much define your musical career i didn't really think of a lot of these things in a very uh, philosophical manner a lot of things that happen like the interview the questions that i usually get over the years i formulated an answer for most things okay okay this might have been the reason and mm-hmm. and for you know for the question of me choosing a career in music for the for the purpose of this studio being there 
I think it was just a natural evolution or progress of whatever I was doing at that point and what I wanted to do at that point. You know, I had a small uh, bedroom studio, you could call, with like small speakers and a mic before going to full sale. So the natural progression was after knowing a lot more, after, you know, handling a lot of world-class equipment, when you come back, you want a bigger space. You want, you aspire to be in a space where it inspires you to create. So I think that was the small time goal. I didn't really think of, okay, five years, six years down the line, you know, this is still going to be my space. I didn't know back then. Mm -hmm. So I, it started off as a pet project and it, it just became, it grew and grew and grew and it became an ambitious project. And I think uh, when me and dad were having a conversation about the studio and it, it just came to life. We both agreed on a lot of things. I think uh, he also felt, you know, I needed a studio at that point to kind of have uh, my experiments taken care of in my own space. I, that also helped me because it, I took a lot of time to understand what I wanted to do in music because I finished college at 19. I didn't really have a picture. People usually, you know, have a pic don't even have a picture at 21 22 they're still you know shuttling between jobs at 19 i had a full time job i had to come back i had to be at the space i had to you know turn everything on in the morning sit and you know create something so it it was just a progression of everything culminating everything that was happening so you graduated full sale and as the the shimmer studio project was probably coming into its second half you returned to india to try and finish that up and complete the studio but, you know, in terms of starting a career, you were out of town for two years, right? So that probably lost you a lot of time in terms of networking. So having been out of town for two years, how difficult was it to network and find the opportunities for the jingles and short films, which kickstarted your career? Very. Up until I had my first film, I had no real opportunities in the industry. I had no real jingles to... I think I, I started composing for jingles after I signed my first film. And my first film, I had to wait, I think, two and a half, three years. 2013, I started, uh, end, I started the studio. So 14, 15, 15 end, I probably signed uh, Ulta. So I had to wait for like two years. I did a lot of independent songs. I tried connecting with a lot of people, but I couldn't because uh, a lot of people that I knew were still in college. They didn't really have the time. They could... Uh, I was in the studio from nine to six or nine to nine. They were in college from nine to five, nine to six. So you don't really have these people coming back. Plus, I didn't really have the budget at that point to invite professionals to come in and record at the studio because I had just invested in the studio. I, I was not in a position to kind of invest again and again and again on more songs. Believe it or not, I didn't really have a bank of songs like people usually say they have when they sign their first film. I was very lucky in that manner to have had producers or directors believe in me at that point to kind of deliver the way they wanted. One of my first stints was uh, with Kalamaster. Uh, not many people uh, acknowledge or know that, but uh, even I forget sometimes that that, that happened within before uh, films. But I composed the theme music for Manada Mailada, the reality show on Kalenya TV. So the theme that many people have heard is... Uh, my theme. So that was an opportunity. So I went on stage, I went on TV, I explained the process. Uh, I had a lot of offers come in or people calling me post that, but it was still nothing concrete. So I had no connections. I had a bunch of like four people, five people that I knew in the industry. And the good part was I ended up finishing my first film with the same five people. And the, the best or even better part of all of that was I still have the same five people working mm -hmm. <laughs> and we have like this very small uh, thing relationship thing going on where all of us there's a synergy between uh, the entire team and it's stayed that way from day one very few people have left but they're still freelancers so I can still uh, they're still friends so I can send them tracks to work on but I think the core team was built at that point and we never actually expanded because since we worked with such a small team from the first film, it kind of opened my eyes to how efficiently a score can be done or songs can be done. But it was super tough. The first two years were just super tough. I didn't have anything going on for myself. Once things did start to kick off for you after that, the two, three years of inactivity, as part of the short films you've worked on, 
you've also crossed the Indian border, particularly with your work with American filmmaker Dylan Hoffman. And I would say it's rare that an Indian composer gets into the Western industries. I could be wrong. Uh, please feel free to correct me if that's the case, but that's sort of my, my perception. And some suggest that this is because Indian music tends to be smeared over by the superficial outsider image of Bollywood. So do you think that there is a sort of typecasting against Indian composers? Definitely. That was there even at the time when I was in college and I used to show people scores. And if, see, the thing is, you derive inspiration from what you've listened to. I've seen English movies, yes, but I primarily watched Tamil movies up until 17, 18. The first time I go to the US, I get introduced to something called Netflix, where there are no Tamil movies. All you have is English <laughs> stuff and French stuff to watch. So at that point, I start understanding English movies better. Because at 17, 16, you know, all we had were pen drives with friends giving us movies. We could just watch them. And we were like, uh, did you watch this new Jason Statham movie? I would say no. And my friend would give a pen drive saying, okay, here, watch it. But you never had the time to really watch it because you were in school. So parents wouldn't take you to an English movie. Uh, and we didn't really have these huge franchise movies back then. Mm -hmm. uh, like Avengers or people having all these Spider-Man movies come up. No, we didn't really have that. But we did have a home theater at home. We did watch. But that was like a one Sunday ritual kind of thing. So I was drawing inspiration from whatever I've heard. So sometimes that creeps in. So maybe in a fight sequence, you start using string runs that are very Indian-ish. It's just associated with Indian music. Let's say a sitar. So as soon as they show a desert, you start hearing the Aud out of nowhere. A Darbuka and an Aud just come, come out of nowhere. Sorry, uh, uh, Darbuka, Jembe and Aud come out of nowhere because that's what Arabic music is or Middle Eastern music is. So as soon as they show Taj Mahal, a sitar starts coming in, a tabla starts coming in. That's like, that's how Hollywood has typecast Bollywood in, in their scores. So if we introduce that even in a fusion kind of way, they say, okay, let's, let's uh, drop the Bollywood-ish thing. Let's, let's go more Hollywood for it. I've had that happen in my own scores. It used to tick me off back then. No, no, because I'm more comfortable in my own skin. So if they have a problem with it, I'll be like, okay, if it doesn't work, I'll, I'll rework it. At, mm -hmm. back at, at that point, I was like, no, I already spent so much time working on this. Why would, I, why would I do this? It took a while to kind of cross that barrier. Plus with Dylan, Dylan was my very, 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 very good friend, best friend. Uh, we were almost, uh, we, we are still like family. So we have that bond from college. So it was easy working with him. I've scored for all his films till date. There, was a, there were a couple more directors that uh, were from outside of Full Sail, but they knew me from Full Sail. So they knew me from the film circle in Full Sail. I used to keep scoring for all the student films at Full Sail. So these people who used to do outside productions in Florida, in and around Florida, they started hearing about me and they used to reach out uh, for scores. So that's, that's pretty much how I got into the industry. I don't think anybody can get into scoring without actually having a history or background uh, there. So you had to know somebody there. You had to have a history there to get your music. It's, it's really tough. If, if I was just here, those connections would have vanished. I would never have had an international film in mind. Soon you got into the cinema world and you made your debut as music director with two songs in Yadamaki Nindrai both of which were critically and commercially extremely successful. I personally have really fond memories with those two songs. I was in the soccer team and we were going to the US for a tournament and I'd forgotten to load songs on my phone. So I only had seven songs and those were three songs from Katra Vilide, an Anirudh single called Unme Agala, Maruvate, and the two songs from Yadamagi and Indrai. So for 28 hours, I was listening to those seven songs on loop. And I didn't get tired of any of them. That's the best thing. So nowadays, when I go back to listen to Purave Nilave or Agayam Tayaga, my mind immediately goes back to that flight. <laughs> uh, I have a very similar story about that with A.R. Rahman songs. But not because I forgot to load, but because... Uh, 
it was back in the day i we used to go for school trips to like uh, uh kerala ooty and munnar uh, i had a disc man with me and i had one disc with me <laughs> which was silin or kadal so for like the next week i could only listen to that one <laughs> disc on repeat i think that that uh why you enjoy the songs that much also is because you spend so much time with the song mm. that, that's primarily the reason why people enjoyed older songs more than they enjoy newer songs because if you don't like a song you have the option to skip back then you couldn't skip i had to like wait an entire song to kind of go to the next song so you learn to adjust and go with the flow more than you know pick and choose people always ask me you know uh, music isn't the same from back then to now but i disagree uh, profusely because you gave it a lot more time to grow on to you back then now you just don't i don't i myself don't even the biggest of stars i i'm like a huge fan of charlie puth but i nitpick on his biggest hits saying i like two of these i don't like uh, three of those whereas if i had given them the equal amount of importance and attention of the songs that i like i would still end up listening to them liking them in the process so yeah, um my personal stories aside uh sorry i digressed but the point about all the new music and your know, music appreciation is something i actually want to get onto in a bit but i want to ask one thing about putave in eleve because actor danush who has sung this song has sung quite a few songs i think at least 30 across his career and i'm not saying this because you're here but i genuinely mean it and i think i've written it on my blog as well putave in eleve is the best by far i've ever heard him sing so like just Thank simply you. put <laughs> was there something special that you did or is it just the type of song that seemed to work with him yeah i think uh, the how putave in eleve came into just reality was is a story in itself because i wanted uh, not many people know but uh, i initially wanted anirudh to sing i had anirudh in my sights and i didn't really reveal it to anybody i just said uh, you know okay it, uh, i sang the song uh, i sang the rock of it it was a very jazzy number uh, i've toned down the jazzy elements in the final thing but i'll i'll get on with it as to why we did all of that so i had uh, this plan of anirudh singing so i sang the rough in a manner where uh, i was emulating what they would do what other people would do in my rough and i had the rough ready we tried reaching anirudh i think i think gayatri was also trying to reach anirudh we don't know what exactly happened we we never actually pursued that we kept talking okay we'll ask anirudh we'll ask anirudh but it just never happened and uh, i think one fine day she met uh, danush in somewhere and she just pitched this idea from her end so it it was actually gayatri's idea of having uh, danush sir on it so and uh, she just asked him can you sing this song for my film and he said okay there there was no other conversation that happened and immediately i get a call saying uh, you have good news uh, you know danush sir is singing the song and i said okay <laughs> I, I, i was not expecting that and uh, at that point i was actually nervous because he uh, he had probably not sung too many songs in that genre i was not worried i was just nervous because i didn't know how to react or how to extract work from somebody like that i was still a novice at that point so then uh, he invited us to the studio uh, we go and we start recording and uh, danush sir is like uh, he hears a song and he goes whatever in love it come to the odi odi atadi in his very unmistakable the the low register voice of his and i don't know what to do because i'm like okay so okay we are we we've started let's see where this goes you know i'm sitting here i'm trying to like make sense of what's happening he understands that i'm really not connecting with whatever is happening and he just cuts the take off and he says you know i'm the singer here you're the uh, you're the composer so you tell me what you want and i say sir uh, just listen to the rough ones and uh, see what you can do to get there and he listen to the rough and he says rough and nalla irukku the rough itself is nice why do you want me to sing this song <laughs> i'm like oh no, 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 i don't want to go there i don't want to you know <laughs> say don't sing so then uh, then he says uh, he was a person who comes up with the idea and he said 
let me just emulate what's there in the rough. So I had sung the rough. So it was, I have this very thin vocal. So I had to sing all these husky lines the way it is in the song. And he just emulated everything. And then he put his own spin. The audio, uh, there was this uh, promise. The, the, ra, 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 ra. All of that is his uh, improvisation on the spot. The tune was... Da, da, ra, 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 ra. It used to be this very rhyme schemey kind of thing. But then Dhanush put it. La, 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 ra, 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 la, la, la. So he used to do all of that. And that's just the singer or the artist or performer in him coming out. So he, he was d- dancing in the booth. It, it was like just eye, eye-opening for me to like see an artist, uh, an actor of that caliber, first and foremost, bringing in that emotion into the song understanding what the song needed and then delivering above and beyond whatever was asked is, is just one journey. And uh, him, I think uh, once we had the first uh, uh, one hour, one and a half hours of recording done, he uh, gets out of the booth and he comes and he, he's talking to me. He's like, so uh, the song had an entire uh, arrangement of sax on it, like a whole quartet or uh, orchestral kind of arrangement of sax on it. So you had sax from all all over the place on it. And he asked me, you know, this song is going to be a hit. Do you really want to complicate it? Do you really want to do all of these arrangement things that only you can hear? Mm. And I was like, it was a very bittersweet thing for me to mute off all those elements. But when I got used to that version, it was a completely different aspect. Plus, there was another tune in the Charnam. Uh, the Manjalil Malay Kolvaye was the was how the Charnam comes back and it it uh, attaches to the Tatarara. That wasn't the idea. The, I had another tune, but uh, Nanishar just stopped singing that tune, and he was like, "Why is this tune here? Why why is this actually in this song? The song is so simple. Why are you wanting to show all your you know?" Musical prowess in this song. Just keep it simple. Don't complicate it. And he just said, take that portion off. Which was the most worrying thing for me because I didn't have any other takes or I, I didn't have a mode to connect the rest of the song back to the, to the hook. And uh, that's when I understood I had a pre-chorus. Treat Manjalil Malay Kolvaya as a pre-chorus. I put that here and I played a different set of chords that complemented it and it, uh, you know, uh, the first time Manjali and Malay Kolvaya comes and the second time it comes, the chord structure is very, very different. Mm. And uh, that leads to the build-up towards the end. And that worked so brilliantly in the song because the song was light because it was very simple. It was still different for Danush sir's uh, repertoire because... Uh, and that... I took a lot of flack for that. A lot of people said I had used a lot of uh, software enhancement. But honestly... Because his register was was pushed up to the high register, his voice sounded so different. So good, actually. And not many people go into that high register of his voice. Everybody stays in this very low baritone yeah. kind of register. I think that's what worked mainly uh, for that, uh, you know, the, the shift in tone that you see in the song. Plus his input of wanting to stay true to the composer's vision, but try and enhance however he could. Like he had to put the Danush spin to it. So that, that's how that entire song happened. It's so simple. It, it, it pretty much has a drum beat going on, a guitar going on. That's pretty much what you can listen, plus a bass guitar going on. And that's that. Because I had so many different elements that just got muted. I was in a very, it wasn't shock. It was just that, okay, let's see how this goes kind of moment and it worked. So it just worked for the best. Was the folkish kutu be at the end part of the Danush spin? No, that that was uh, already there. We already okay. wanted the the jazz to transition into this kutu kind of uh, element, which all worked to his strength because that's what makes Danush sir so special. The folk mm-hmm. element to all of his uh, products is what makes him special. So I think it tied in together with bringing him in on the track. It was all just coincidence at that point. Hmm. But obviously you've done other songs too, particularly with your first full album with Bidi Madi Ulta. But yeah, I sort of want to go a bit general and you know, feel free to reference your songs or any other song 
for that matter, as you go about answering these questions. Music, it said, it needs to be a journey. You know, there needs to be direction, some sort of start point, some sort of end point. Which element of music drives this direction? The rhythm, primarily. And I think uh, I spend most time on the rhythm because that's what gives the song the color. All the other instruments, let's say a guitar, a nadaswaram, a uh, tabal, tabla, uh, no, 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 not tabal, tabla, uh, all of the melodic instruments, strings, you hear that on a million other songs. But when you mix that with, how do you say EDM? You, because you hear the four on the floor kicks. How do you say dubstep? Because of two. So, so I think rhythms is what primarily defines genre. And uh, you get interesting ideas when you blend different rhythm aspects into the song. And that's something that I've carried over from Pudave Nalave till songs that I do know. So Pudave Nalave had this jazz beat going on in the first and then it shifts to the kutta. But the tune is the same. I didn't, I didn't really change anything. The tune is the same. But what makes you say it's kutta is because of the percussion element that comes in. So I pretty much find the beat is where you can create so much dynamism, energy to drive the song or pull back the song the way you want. So in a song like Unnerikam, say, particularly the Pallavi, is sort of absent in percussion. You, know, you just sort of have this sparring sounds. It's not like a steady beat. Whereas in the Charnam, you, know, you sort of have this more steady beat. Was that your plan to try and create this journey through rhythm? I think with Unnerikam, the, the point was not to focus on the rhythm. The rhythm was more a, was an extension of the emotion that I wanted to create in the song. I think with Unnerikam, the major focus that I wanted to have was on the vocals and the piano riff that, uh, dun, 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 dun. there's a piano riff that comes in that I really like, which I was inspired by from a lot of other songs. It's a very common riff, but that just works so well with the tune that I was doing on top of it. Plus, you know, the steady rhythm. The whole point of that song being very unique or different is because the rhythm is very sparse or it kicks in whenever you're not expecting it to kick in. So if you're expecting to, it doesn't do any of that. It comes in all the odd pockets where you won't expect anything to come in. That was also primarily the reason why a lot of people couldn't connect with it as much as possible. Like we still have like 4 million views on it. It was, it is still my highest played, highest viewed song. It's, it, it was my number one playing song, number one on repeat song on the radio. But, but the thing is, a lot of people get back to me and say, you know, if you had just made that rhythm a lot more accessible, it would have flown through the shelves. And uh, that was something that I experimented with during the lockdown, where I released a version with Johnny Ayer of the same cover. And I had a very straight rhythm of it. And dude, it did so well. It did so well. It, it uh, raked up like a lakh uh, views on Instagram out of nowhere. We didn't have to do anything. And so many people called me and said, this song is so good. Whereas I'm like, it's not a new song. It's a cover of my <laughs> existing song. So the rhythm changed the entire composition so much. The tempo, the rhythm changed the color of composition so much. To a point where I still don't feel uh, I've done justice to the cover because the original is so good. I, I, it's still one of my favorites. Agayam, Taayaga and Unnerikam are like one of my favorites. And it's one of the genres that I really excel in. Like slow it down, let the, uh, like ballads, slow ballads is where I excel in. But Unnerikam was an experiment. Like it's a whole journey and whole story. It's where my relationship with Sid started. It's where uh, my thing with Chinmay coming in and just transforming half the song started. Up until that point, I don't think there was a song where Sid Sriram was put in the second half of the song. <laughs> and uh, there was another voice in the first half. I don't think there's still a song where Sid comes in in the second part. So uh, Sid kept telling me, Dude, don't mute my vocals. Don't do that. <laughs> And uh, the duet was so good that I had to keep the backing vocals, not because he asked, but because it complemented so well for the mm. composition. He was there in the US when he was recording that. Chinmay was here and it just worked so well, the, the intertwining of all the elements. Mm. 
I mean, I, I suppose you sort of alluded to the answer of the next question I was thinking of asking, but I'll ask it anyways. Um, when you're talking about experimentation and trying new things, in the advertisement video for Shimmer Studios on the website of Shimmer Studios, the first tagline that comes up is, are you an artist that breaks the rules? So that being the sort of center of Shimmer Studios' aim, what rules do you think you've broken throughout your career as a musician in the Tamil film and independent industry? I don't really think of myself as breaking rules, but uh, breaking my own convictions of what a song should be. Uh, so let's say if somebody told me uh, I couldn't do a song without an intro, I have songs that just start straight up on the Pallavi. So uh, it's just all these little things that I call, I call them experiments, but when they work, they become new set of standards or rules for ourselves. So a lot of people complain that I don't have uh, uh, extended uh, BGs, like background uh, music and songs. Uh, you also brought up that. <laughs> the thing is, that stemmed from me. I used to make seven and a half minute songs, eight minute songs. I had to scale down so much because uh, the consumption of said songs just so rapidly changed. When you go into radio or something, uh, you know, the landscape is very different. So I think with, I don't want to go too much into that right now because the question wasn't that. <laughs> but but the, to answer your question, yes, I think uh, less amount. Uh, I, I, I pretty much have a rule that if it crosses three minutes, you ba basically I have to count everything that crosses three minutes and like if it's not really needed, just chop off and just keep it under three. Uh, that's like something that I stick to that's brought my productivity up a lot. It works for films also because film songs just end up being three minutes, three and a half minutes. If not, I could make a five minute song. Thing is, they just trim it off. They make it a three and a half minute song, whether I like it or not. Mm -hmm. So there, there's no point in being attached to your music uh, to the point of, you know, you don't want it to be in any other shape and size or form. Unnerukam had uh, me reeling with that. I was bawling my eyes out because the film version of Unnerukam was 3 minutes, 2 seconds or 10 seconds. Whereas the song was 4 minutes, 45. It's like an entire journey. You had to like go through that entire journey to understand all the different layers and why everything takes so much time to build and work together. So when they cut off sections, I was like, okay, this isn't working. Plus, Agayam Tayaga, had so so there's a small six count pause that I give for every phrase. Yeah. You would not believe that radios cut that six second pause every time it played on the radio. So that oh. was a learning experience for me to not give silence in songs where it's a whole different landscape today. The music industry relies on how people are responding to music, how uh, uh, radios are responding to music, how YouTube responds to your uh, thing. Now the basic rule is first 15 seconds need to be the most catchy part or you know really unique thing about the song because first 15 seconds decide whether a listener is going to listen to this song or it's going to skip the song. So that's where I place my intros. I'll give it like a really nice breezy intro, like something that just catches your attention out of nowhere or sticks saying this is the, from this song. So I pay a lot of attention to the intros. I don't pay as much attention to the Bee Gees because people are already into the song. If they have listened to this point, I'm, I've already won. I don't really have to you know, keep explaining more in the song. So that's that. Plus, uh, I think uh, I've experimented a lot with just vocal hummings instead of uh, instruments. So instead of an instrument coming, uh, my idea of a song is the vocal is the stellar star and most of the audience respond to vocals the best. So if you can have somebody, and that's why Sid's song sells so much because he has so many runs that probably a violin should be doing, but he's doing all those runs and that makes you fall in love with his voice. So those are the little, little things that I've kind of picked up and it's kind of been made into my style. And I have this very verse, chorus, verse, pre-chorus, chorus kind of uh, structure to all my songs. Unnerikam has that. 
agayam thayaga has that but it's not up front it's not to your face i just blend it in with a lot of other things so it's it's not as apparent but my upcoming releases have a lot of lot more up front stuff i i'm basically blatantly telling this is what i'm following this is what i'm going to do if you like it just come along with the ride if you if not i have more songs for you to come <laughs> along with the ride then, so. you talk about you know how for example in agayam thayaga they they cut your silences off and probably the same might have happened with podavena lave as well i'm guessing because you know the that sort of- only had the breaks for uh, two two places where danush still sings uh, promise or uh, there's that word that he still has and it has uh, uh, somebody like danush on it and it's a faster song than agayam thayaga mm. the thing with radio is they want the song to get over in like two and a half minutes that's why they prefer playing the faster songs on the radio because they get more time to play their ads mm. within songs if your song is going to go on for 5 minutes they, they lose out on ad space uh, they have to sit and edit your song to 2 and 1/2 minutes more so now with a lot more party songs coming in with a lot more dance music coming in you don't really have much music to write and even if you write that much music your song is not going to cross 3 and 1/2 minutes because of the tempo and the beat that is i think put away in elve escape that So you talk about how the radio cuts things off because of their ad potential and commercial incentives. Do you think the industry is losing its sort of musical honesty because of this increased commercialization not only in radio but you know also in YouTube and with online record labels and all that? Definitely. There's no two ways about it. But the thing is with shrinking budgets like your budgets are shrinking so you need to kind of pick and choose the number of musicians you want on the track so usually uh let's say let's take mercil's songs or any song so the raman songs will always have that one interlude that features a very unique instrument uh suddenly out of nowhere now that instrument player is so coveted or rare that he will charge a bomb for the recording session So if I had to call him I had I have to like let go of a guitarist an electric guitarist and two three more people to get this one person into the track that might work for film but not in an indie production because we we work with very tight budgets or most of the time zero no budgets so I think that's that's also part of it we don't really have the budget to kind of bring in the musicality uh into the song so we make shift with whatever works best with what we have in our hand so it does suffer but again you get a lot more experimental stuff in music people are uh, doing a lot of these i think gopi sundar in some some interview was like uh, i did this intro of the song with my hand and he just started like uh, whistling or uh, singing with his hand like this so he made like a nadaswaram hand nadaswaram or something and i'm like this dude basically didn't have this nadaswaram player come in or, or maybe he didn't he might have had the budget maybe the player just didn't turn up for the session or he just had to do this because he had to explain it to the director that the nadaswaram will sound like this and it was hitting these notes but people just got used to it so much and it was processed well that it got thrown into the final track so i think uh a lot of these limitations and this necessity to you know experiment brings out all these new stuff so you lose something you gain something mm. and if you lose musicians you know that probably means that you gain more in terms of the involvement of technology in music and i want to ask a question about you know technology inside music because a few weeks ago you had tweeted and i'll quote you here mm-hmm. <laughs> quote These are exciting yeah. times to be a music producer. Some of these plug-in algorithms can make music sound as balanced as I can, if not more, with my dozens of EQ, compression, and reverb hardware slash plugins in a fraction of the time. But can they write lyrics, make beats, record vocals, absorb the history of recorded music, and come up with a cool direction that's perfect for the artist? Thought so. End quote. So that's, that's a tweet that you put out a few weeks ago. So, I'm just playing devil's advocate here. So, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this statement implies that there are limits to the roles technology plays within music. 
So when technology has been progressing so rapidly over the past few years, to the extent that you know, we now have AI composed music, what makes you so confident that technology can't progress to the extent of beat production, of learning musical history through machine learning and so on? That was just a current analysis of what was happening. Because we do have AI plugins. I myself use AI plugins. Uh, the software has gotten to a point where it's scary that we have to reinforce our thoughts to people that we are still needed at this point. At this point, it's still nascent. We are sitting here as musicians, you know, uh, telling the software what we want. But there's going to be a time when there's so much data, where so much data has been fed into the software that it starts spitting out data when, you know, there's just so many rules to music. So if I want to create a house track, what do I do? I immediately go to a tempo of 125 to 127. That's, that's every EDM house track that you listen to. EDM different house is pretty much 125, 127. So that's like the first rule that the AI picks. So it, it's going to ask you what kind of track? House. So it's going to pick 125, 127. See, all of the things that we learn in music, let's say a happy skill is going to be a major skill. A sad skill is going to be a minor skill. So it's going to ask happy, sad, thoughtful, optimistic. So if you click happy, it's going to bring up, bring up a C major scale or an F major scale. It's going to be really happy, really bright. And then it's going to have uh, optimistic or uh, bright and cheerful. So folk music. Folk music usually has F major, a G major. So all these F and C, Nalikata, Anjikata, it's, uh, it's superb for folk music. F and G is like the, the thing where folk music lives. So that's, that's pretty much your song. You, you pretty much have a scale. You pretty much have a tempo. You pretty much have the genre uh, put in. Then house music is going to have to chuck, to chuck, to chuck going on. So you have that. Then the bass line is going to dum, 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 dum. So that's going to, that's house music. So all of these are just presets that we do as musicians when you start sketching out a track. It's from there re-sketching the track to kind of bring your own spin to it. That's where your creativity comes in. Other than that, everything else happens with, uh, you know, presets or rules that have already been set or w already works. So most of the stuff that we do is already programmed or can be programmed. It's just the last bit of extra spark that can't be brought in by these, these uh, plugins. There's also this cool tool that can write lyrics now. There is already album name generator, song lyrics generator that, that uh, uh, you just have to fill in what you want or what you need from it. And they spit out uh, inspiration out of nowhere in seconds. So it's just a matter of time. But still, there's that element of magic that an actual human being brings in or an element of difference that an actual human being brings in that cannot be programmed into the algorithm. But, um, I just want to touch on something that you said about major scales mm -hmm. being happy and minor mm -hmm. scales being sad. Yeah, I think that that does tend to be a general rule of thumb. I'm not exactly sure why, but if you look at dance music, if you look at, you know, Indian Kuttu music, a lot of it tends to be in minor keys. Minor scale, yeah. Yeah. That's so, because why you exactly have the that? opportunity. That's because you have the opportunity. Major scale is a lot more limiting than minor scales. So even though the minor scale sounds somber or stuff, it's still happy. You can make it sound happy because of the notes you can choose on top of it. Plus, you have the opportunity to go sad. You have the opportunity to go happy also. So you can just hit the relative major of the same mm. scale and you can start singing happy. So uh, it's, it's because of that that most music that we hear today is with minor skills because it has a lot more uh, has a lot of potential to open up uh, your melodies in a lot of different ways all right um i know you have a recording in just about 10 minutes so we'll just go into the the final segment yeah you know, just talking about what's in the cards for you what's coming up in the future so just in general what can you tell to listeners in terms of what the future holds for you for me personally, uh, people still judge me from the music that I've done in the first two films. 
I have a third one coming out that has a couple of songs, uh, really nice songs. Uh, I've sung one in that too. So that's going to come out very soon. Plus, all my indie releases are coming out. The indie releases are where, I won't say I truly shine, but it's like uh, another expression of myself that, that comes through in the form of music that nobody really directs for me. So uh, I've been happy that, uh, you know, the lockdown happened and it really pushed me to kind of find a voice that was not for film and not really indie. It was, it was somewhere in the middle that both people from both uh, segments could listen to. So I have a bunch of tracks that are coming out that sounds indie, but can be commercial. So can sound filmy. So I have all of that coming out, uh, which I'm very excited about. I've not had a release for the past, I think, five, six months. I'm not sure. Uh, but think, there's just um, so much music. Might have made it? Was prob- no, Thorne. Might have. Uh, Thorne was the last yeah, uh, proper Thorne. release. I've had smaller, smaller releases. I've had a lot of uh, uh, short film scores and short films that uh, had releases. I had jingles that uh, had releases. But the thing is, I don't have like a track. Mm. Like people would say, what's your latest track? And that's still like a year old. So uh, I have so much content. I have so much music that uh, I've worked on this past year that uh, will come out. will have a very different voice to whatever I've done in the first two films. So I'm still finding my voice. But I think the current stuff is where I'm really focused on and I'm really, you know, invested in because it's a lot groovier to my previous stuff. I think you would also agree with yeah. that. It's a lot groovier to what I was making. And uh, to the people that I've showed it to, they've been enjoying it more because it has a, it has more pep to it, more rhythm to it. So I'm happy that it reaches that extra bit of people also. So that's what's happening. Plus I have two more films that I'm working on. Too, too early to discuss the production house names and the names of the films uh, because we've just gotten permission to start shooting from yesterday here uh, in India. So... Uh, exciting times again. So they're going to be calling me left, right, center to start finishing all these tracks that I've been doing scratches of over in the lockdown. So films are starting. Uh, independent releases are coming up. I have some short films that are also coming up. It's just a barrage of stuff. Plus, I'm doing another uh, score for Dylan. So that's it. Oh. Just so much stuff, so much backlog that's there in my Dropbox. People would not believe that. I, pe- people honestly think that I've been sleeping or something, but there's just so much content that I can just keep sending people. Uh, but it's good now because now is the first time in my life that I actually have a catalog of stuff to show people. From my first film till now, I've never had a catalog. So all the songs that have probably released have all been done for that film, for that particular situation only. I've never written that song elsewhere for anybody else. So hopefully that continues because that that is where uh, it's it's nice because every time i listen to a certain song let's say agayam taig or unnerku i go back to the point of writing that it's not something that i've written 6 years back and then it came out 6 years later so it, i immediately connect to writing that song for that film and the story attached to it so it makes it so much more personal and uh, i can connect with stories there are always stories to this Else, you know what happens? I would have done this tune uh, six years ago and this would be picked for a film and there's no story to it because it just sort of happens and I'll end up singing it because I've heard my voice for six years. So this new path is really nice and I'm just waiting for people to listen and get back. I've been talking to Sony. I just spoke to Sony also. So they've been, uh, you know, wanting to listen to tracks. I've been speaking to U1 Search team for certain releases. So Everything is out there. I'm just waiting for it all to fall through and, you know, come out as releases. So I'll have a steady release plan for the next six, seven months. Sort. All right. We'll end with the ending question that I ask all of my guests, which is what's on your playlist right now? My playlist? I think Charlie Poot. <laughs> Charlie Poot <laughs> is right there. Um, I think uh, Anirudh's uh, Chalama is uh, there. Uh, there was something else. Dil Pechara. Dil Pechara is probably on the top of my playlist right now. Anything Charlie Puth is always on my playlist because I'm like, I'm a huge fan of Charlie Puth. Anirudh's Chalamma is like super dance number. Yeah. It's uh, 
super it's it's just guilt free music you can just put it on and be like okay i, I don't have to think about anything you don't have to think about musicality or anything just rock out to it kind of music so that this uh, dil bechra dil bechra the entire album is brilliant i've i've been telling everybody to kind of just get on that because people keep uh, nagging raman sir saying raman sir hasn't delivered an album for the past 6 years i don't care whether he delivered an album or not he, he has one album <laughs> you go and listen to that that's enough so that pretty much does it from me thank you so much for your time thank you for thank the you. listeners who have tuned in and mm-hmm. stayed for however long this podcast turns out to be make sure you check out ashwin's social media which will be in the links in the description thank you so much thank you see you Well, that was Ashwin Vinayagamurthy on today's episode of the Indo Answers podcast. You can find us at the Indo Answers spelled T H E I N D O E N C E R S on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, or you can use the links in the description. Likewise, you can find our home page at the Indo Answers.wordpress.com or through the link in the description. Make sure to subscribe to the Indoencers podcast on your favorite podcasting platform. Thank you once again and we'll see you next time.